Mr. Speaker, as I present my 2024-2025 budget address, I am honored and gratified to be leading this country with the support of a dedicated team of men and women through a third budget cycle for this session of Parliament as the Minister for Finance. Mr. Speaker, I am encouraged by the overwhelming support of solutions at home and in, in the diaspora. This support has kept me focused and purpose-driven in dispatching my responsibilities to the people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, my address contains reflections of my government's performance since, since assuming office a little over two and a half years ago and its plans for the ensuing year. As, al as has always been the case, our plans are rooted in the principles of accountability transparency, truth, and integrity, the cornerstones of credible, trustworthy, democratic institutions and governments. Mr. Speaker, our task in building a better St. Lucia has been made a little more challenging when the virtue of truth and its value in enabling public enlightenment and human upliftment seem to be totally lost on some individuals who wish to lead this country. Sadly, they shamelessly believe and avow that the truth is whatever you deem it to be and not what it is. By their belief and the public pronouncements, they have demonstrated contempt and disrespect for the citizens of the country. It is their way of saying that the citizens of St. Lucia do not deserve to know the truth. We must therefore, as a government, fight this disrespect and contempt for the citizens of this country wherever and whenever it is manifested. And so, Mr. Speaker, for our part, my government will continue to demonstrate its commitment to provide a truthful account of its stewardship to the people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the country's finances have improved significantly since July 26, 2021. Fiscal prudence and financial responsibility have returned to the management of our finances. Our economy has emerged from the downward spiral that once threatened to destroy our economic prosperity. The economic indicators have returned to, and in some cases have surpassed pre-COVID-19 levels. Investor confidence and trust in the St. Lucian economy have returned with new investments in tourism, ports, sports infrastructure, manufacturing, and the blue economy. Mr. Speaker, you can feel the positive change in the economy despite the challenges of inflationary pressures and the troubling crime situation. The positive change in economic landscape permeates the atmosphere as citizens go about their daily lives. Our social economic policies have shielded the population from the full impact of inflation while providing new job opportunities for those seeking work, especially the youth and women. In addition to facilitating new job opportunities, we have purposefully supported the less fortunate and marginalized. Mr. Speaker, my government has undertaken a series of initiatives that has already transformed the social and economic landscape of this country. As a precondition for reshaping the country, we have stabilized the finances of the country and placed the public debt on a sustainable path. We have established the youth economy. We energized and repositioned the tourism sector, expanded education opportunities and scholarships for students in keeping with our one university per household, provided tangible support to teachers, parents, public officers, farmers, fishers, pensioners, micro, small, and medium-sized businesses, created employment for sportsmen for the semi-professional football league, improved the ease of doing business environment, expanded health care, access for the elderly, pregnant mothers, diabetic and high blood pressure patients, equipped law enforcement with the appropriate training and operational equipment to combat, to combat crime, enhanced the protection of our natural patrimony and the environment, advanced the digital transformation of government services, implemented tax reforms and, and tax amnesty to citizens and businesses, and improved the tax refund processes. Mr. Speaker, 
The people-centric policies of this government under the mantra putting people first are well rooted in our philosophical belief in social justice and wealth creation. These principles, along with good governance, will continue to guide the thinking, actions, and developmental thrust of this government. We believe no one should be left behind, especially the less fortunate and marginalized, while our country advances towards greater economic prosperity. We will continue to deliver on our 2021-26 party manifesto promises to the people of St. Lucia. During my statement on the estimates for, for revenue and expenditure, I emphasize that this 24-25 budget aims to establish a strong foundation for sustainable economic growth. The investments and employment opportunities that will be provided across all major sectors of the economy will bring real hope to the people. We will continue to build upon our previous successes, which have resulted in impressive economic rate growths of 11.5%, 20% and 2.2% in GDP after a contraction of over 24.5% in 2020. Mr. Speaker, permit me to place the 2024-2025 budget in its proper context by presenting our scorecard on the last two budgets and the reason for our optimistic outlook. Here are some of the highlights of our numerous achievements. One, unemployment was reduced to 14%, the lowest level in 16 years. <laughs> Serious inroads in youth unemployment were achieved and remained committed to its reduction as the youth economy builds momentum. We provided over 11,700 new laptops to our students, putting us on track to provide every St. Lucian student in a secondary school with a laptop under our one laptop per child policy. We have reinvested heavily in TVET education certification to close the gap between skills and jobs available in the private sector. We introduced the highly anticipated <coughs> Universal Health Care, UHC, which offers senior citizens free medical care at hospitals and wellness centers across the island, as well as, well as prenatal and postnatal care to mothers. On, on August 2nd, 2023, we removed 12.5% 12, 12 value-added tax on medical equipment for two years to incentivize medical practitioners to procure medical equipment and to reduce the cost of medical examinations. We launched the 80 plus healthcare campaign in July 2023, which gives access to a package of free medical services at community wellness centers to persons 80 years and over. These services include prescription drugs, annual hearing tests, and access to the services at the Cuban Eye Clinic. Since November 1st, 2022, we continue to make significant progress on the reconstruction of the St. Jude Hospital. We secured US 75 million from Saudi Arabian Development Fund to complete the hospital and the re rehabilitation of the George Odlum Stadium. We launched the micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises loan grant facility for 10 million to support the post-COVID pandemic recovery and growth of the MSME sector. In March 2023, we paid millions in outstanding back pay to public servants. We facilitated access to finance to the operations of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex in the amount of 23.05 million. We paid 11.5 million in August last year to honor commitments made by the last administration to help City Cayman for medical consultancy fees. We injected $1 million into the reinstated distress fund to bring relief to fire victims with uninsured homes. July 2023, we removed the 12.5% value-added tax on selected building materials, which included plywood, lumber, cement, galvanized, and solar PV systems for a two-year period to encourage home improvements. In October 2023, we secured funding of 26 million for the St. Lucia Fire Service 
to procure new ambulances and fire and fire appliances and for the reconfiguration of fire service administration and training facilities. In August 2023, we paid an additional $600 to teachers for classroom material, which brought the allowance to $1,400 per year. We secured additional financing of $20.5 million to support the Youth Economy Agency the year, which provides funding for an additional 3,000 young solutions to assist them in turning their talents and skills and hobbies into viable business enterprises. In August 2023, we secured a landmark development of Global Port Holdings, GPH, to develop the cruise infrastructure of Port Castries and Port Souffre. In May 2023, St. Lucia became the fifth member state of the Caribbean community to accede to the appellant jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice, the CCJ, making access to justice for our children more accessible and affordable. We have commenced construction of the new custody suites to facilitate the police in crime fighting and the preservation of law and order in the country. We have commenced construction of EC 45 million Northern Divisional Police Headquarters in Grosily and have almost completed major renovations on the Southern Divisional Headquarters in Viewfort. These facilities are expected to significantly improve the working environment of our police officers. Throughout the year, the police was supported with strategic investments in technical training, tactical equipment, special operational assets, motor vehicles, motorcycles and bicycles. In addition, the capacity of the forensic lab was strengthened with cutting-edge fire identification and analysis equipment. In November 2023, we made a one-time payment of $600 to approximately 3,000 government pensioners, amounting to $1.7 million, in addition to 500 payment in November 2022, amounting to $1.4 million. In December 2023, we began providing income support payments of $1,500 per person to 500 households in the informal sector workers who are adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. This will continue into the new year with $5 million set aside for that program. The government paid over $20 million in tax refunds to taxpayers in 2023. In, in April 2023, we extended the 100% waiver on interest and penalties for individuals and businesses on all taxes, including VAT and withholding tax, provided that these taxes were settled in full by May 1, 2024. We have removed withholding taxes of 10% on small contracts, up to $10,000, to provide more disposable income for small contractors. After inheriting, inheriting payables of $160 million due to local businesses, the government has settled 50% of these payables, effectively in, injecting $80 million into the local business sector. To assist with combating imported inflation, the government continues to subsidize the 20 and 22 pound cooking gas at an average of $15 per cylinder, which amounted to 8.1 million during 2023 and 13.4 million in 2022. Throughout 2023, the government heavily subsidized the price of flour, sugar, and rice, amounting to 11.5 million in 2022. In 2022, the subsidy on flour alone was 8.9 million, of which 5.6 million went to bakers and 3.3 million went to the public. We removed the 6% service charge on price control products. We removed VAT charges on sanitary products for women, for women and placed those products under the price control list of items, which meant a further reduction in cost by the removal of the 6% service charge. We launched a 27 million project to assist farmers in building adaptive and harvest, adapt, adapting capabilities harvesting rainwater, practicing soil conservation and management, and developing green agro-processing facilities and parks. We commenced work on the Shurzel Fishing Port and the Denry Fish Landing Facility. We have also started work on other fish landing facilities and the construction of the Miku Jetty and Fish Landing Facility. 
qualified fisher folk with valid licenses who are affiliates of registered fisher folk societies now receive a $2.50 per gallon fuel rebate up from the previous $1.50. Construction work has started on the library markets and square. Construction work has started on the Larissus Health and Wellness Center. These, Mr. Speaker, are just some of the many initiatives undertaken by this government that have, that have brought the meaningful change to the socio-economic landscape of our country and the lives of ordinary citizens who deserve a better St. Lucia. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the global, the global economy grew by 3.5% in 2022, and in 2023 by 3.1%. These rates are below historical annual growth rates of 3.8% over the period 2000 to 2019. The global economy is expected to grow at 3.1% in 2024 and nudging up to 3.2% in 2025. The lower than normal global growth rates in 2024 and 2025 are the result of continuing supply chain issues and the war in Ukraine and now in Gaza. Global trade remains relatively weak, with 2023 being the weakest outside the global recession in the past 50 years, a consequence of more restrictive trade practices being adopted by some countries. The recovery in services is almost complete, with tourism nearing pre-COVID levels, however, the slowdown in the interest rate sensitive manufacturing sector has been on account of higher product prices, reduced demand, tightening of credit conditions, unwinding of, cri of crisis policy support, and geopolitical tensions in Russia and the Middle East. Mr. Speaker, prices of most commodities have dropped from the 2022 peaks, but are still above pre pandemic levels. Global headline consumer inflation fell because of low energy and food prices. <coughs> Crude oil prices were volatile in 2023, averaging at US $77 per barrel, or 16% lower than in 2022. In the case of food, improvement in supply chain constraints accounted for the reduction in prices. Global inflation fell from an average of 8.7% in 2022 to to 6.8% in 2023. Despite the fall, prices remain above, about 40% above pre-pandemic levels and the industrial countries. Mr. Speaker, growth in advanced economies slowed down from 2.6% in 2022 to 1.6% in 2023, despite a, rel a relaxation of fiscal policy. However, the U.S. recorded the strongest recovery due to strong consumer demand. Mr. Speaker, slow, slower growth rates are expected in 2024 for the, largest, the three largest economies, U.S., China, and Japan. In the U.S., demand is expected to slow down. The lagging effect of tight monetary policy, gradual fiscal consolidation, and a softer labor market. U.S. growth is projected at 2.1% in 2024 from 2.5% in 2023, while growth in China is expected to slow down to 4.6% in 2023 and Japan down to 0.9% in 2024 from 1.9% 1 in 2023. In the euro area, growth is expected to gradually recover from a low rate of 0.5 in 2023 to 0.9 in 2024 Consumer spending is expected to increase in anticipation of lower energy prices. Economic growth of 0.6 is projected for the UK in 2024. Mr. Speaker, headline inflation in advanced economies fell sharply in 2023, prompting central banks to hold back on any further early reduction in interest rates at the end of 2023. Despite signs of softening, labor markets remain buoyant with historically low unemployment rates. Banks reported restrictive lending standards, slowing down bank credits, corporate bankruptcies, 
and credit card delinquencies were reportedly on the increase, while private sector debt service ratios rose but remained at manageable levels. The risk appetite for financial markets remained resilient despite higher interest rates. Despite having to navigate the challenging external environment, including the global economic slowdown, Caribbean economies continue to rebound from the pandemic, albeit at a slow rate in 2023 compared to 2022. Several countries surpassed pre-pandemic output levels in 2023, while economic activity continued to grow extraordinary in Guyana. As a predominantly tourism-dependent region, the ongoing recovery of tourism was a key driver of the region's economic outcomes, with the ending of COVID-related health restrictions. Total visitor arrivals were near pre-COVID-19 levels, boosted by continuing improvements in Elif and the return of more festivals and sporting events across the region, mirroring, mirroring downward international movements, inflation rates eased, although food prices remained high, supported by rising consumer demand. This prompted some governments to provide relief to consumers from high food prices in 2023. Mr. Speaker, over the past three years, the St. Lucian economy has been growing. The growth has been experienced across many sectors, with business confidence up and unemployment down. Construction is up by 19.2% over 2022, and tourism near pre-COVID levels and growing, with March 2024 being St. Lucia's best month on record. In March 2024, tourism arrivals were up on the same period last year by 13% with the U.S. up by 14%, the U.K. up by 4%, and the Caribbean by 55%, and Canada by 7%. For the quarter January to March 2024, tourism arrivals were up on the same period in 2023 by 11%. The U.S. is up 10%, the U.K. 2%, the Caribbean by 63%, and Canada by 8%. Mr. Speaker, Current growth projections remain very encouraging, with an increase in Elif, the island's hosting of ICC World Cup cricket matches, and the 2024 carnival season. Mr. Speaker, cruise arrivals continue to increase and are expected to increase by 15% in 2024. Mr. Speaker, the increase in construction activity was encouraged by the reduction in the price of building materials, the result of VAT exemption on certain building materials. Mr. Speaker, I will outline later in my presentation further details on the construction sector. Mr. Speaker, manufacturing output increased by 11.9% over 2022 and by 4% in 2022 over 2021. These increases were accounted for by improved performances in both the export and domestic markets. Mr. Speaker, the value of manufacturing outputs reached 771.8 million in 2023, an increase of 14.4% over 2022. Mr. Speaker, in my presentation of the estimates, I explained that there was an improvement in the primary and current balance surpluses in 2023-2024, with the current balance representing 0.9% of GDP. I noted, however, that there was an overall deficit, meaning that there was still a need to borrow to finance budgeted capital expenditure. Mr. Speaker, it is only by growing the economy and the prudent management of the country's finances that we can reduce our level of borrowing to finance capital expenditure. Let me reiterate, having surpluses does not mean having surplus cash. It's a case of having to borrow less or reduce our debt commitments. Mr. Speaker, public debt at the end of 2023 was 4.7 billion, increasing the debt to GDP ratio to 72.9%. Interest payments increased by 17.2% to 341.3 million, representing 25.4% of current revenue. Mr. Speaker, it, it remains the government's policy to convert its borrowing from short-term to long-term instruments. However, 
we are carefully observing trends in interest rates movements for re-evaluation re of that policy. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to inform honorable members that local payables for suppliers have been reduced from 154 million at July 21, 2022 to 84 million on April 18, 2024. Mr. Speaker, the government has fully paid up its NIC obligations in contributions and lease payments. Mr. Speaker, in the global monetary system, St. Lucia's net foreign assets expanded by 52.5% to a high of 2.4 billion in December 2023, while its net foreign assets at the ECCB increased by 20% to 1 billion. Lend lending rates decreased marginally, while interest on deposits inched up. Growth in deposits continued to outpace credit growth resulting in high liquidity levels in the banking system. The capital adequacy rate, the CAR, in the banking sector strengthened from 15.9% from in December 2022 to 18.5% in December 23, above the regulatory mil minimum of 8%. Mr. Speaker, non-performing loans increased from 14.2% to 14.5% in December 23. Credit union credit rose by 30.5% to 1.1 billion in 2023, while credit union delinquency ratio fell from 8.6% to 6.8%. In the insurance sector, gross insurance premiums increased by 10.5% to 293.9 million in 2023. This contributed to an improvement in the sector's operating profit of 15.9% in 2023 from 10.8% in 2022. Mr. Speaker, there was an increase in the import bill, resulting in the widening of, of the merchant trade deficit by 8% to 2.2 billion in 2023. Non-imports rose by 3.6% to 1.7 billion, reflecting the expansion in economic activity coupled with increases in imported prices, the food import bill expanded by 1.4% to $491 million. Mr. Speaker, based on, S on preliminary estimates, the agriculture sector declined, following an increase of 4% in the preceding year. Lower levels of output were seen in all sectors, including livestock, fish fisheries, bananas, and other crops, mainly due to supply supply side challenges. The weakened performance was in part due to tropical storm breadth in June 2023 and financing difficulties faced by farmers related to the high cost of inputs. Mr. Speaker, we'll outline the government's plans to revive the agriculture sector later in the presentation. Unemployment. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with the increase in economic activity, there was an improvement in labor market conditions. The, unem the employed labor force, the employed labor force was estimated to have grown by 6.7% to 97,394 in 2023 due to an expansion in economic activity. This level of employment represented 86% of the labor force of 14% unemployment. In 2023, higher employment was recorded for both genders, with male employment rising by 8.5% to 54,387, and female employment by 4.5% to 43,007 in 2023. Youth unemployment rate was estimated to have decreased for the third consecutive year to 25% in 2023 from 26.8% in 2022 and 38.2% in 2020. Mr. Speaker, we are still not satisfied with this youth unemployment rate and we will do more to reduce it. Avail available statistics suggest a labor force rising to an all-time high 
of 113,246 in 2023. Mr. Speaker, the total number of active contributors to the NIC at February 2024 was the highest on record, 63,474. Mr. Speaker, in relation to prices, domestic inflation is expected to lower to around 2.5% 2 to 2, 2 in 2024. In the absence of any increase in geopolitical risks, oil prices are, expect, are expected to dip modestly in 2024 on account of economic slowdown in U.S. and China. However, in the last quarter of the fiscal year, 2023-2024, crude, crude oil prices inched up by 0.9% over the same period in 2023-2024. Aside from any further external shocks, domestic inflation is anticipated to gradually lessen in 2024-2025 Setting at about 1.5 percent per annum over the medium term. Key external downside risks include low economic growth in economies of our main trading partners, increasing commodity prices, new bouts of global in inflationary pressures, and an intensification of geopolitical tensions and wars. On the domestic front, natural disasters and low levels of project implementation can reduce the desired level of economic activity planned for 2024-2025. Mr. Speaker, allow me now to move from reflection to what lies ahead for the fiscal year 2024-2025. It is of a sense of relief that following the trail of financial disasters left by the previous administration, the way ahead now looks promising. And there is real hope for better St. Lucia. Sadly, an indisputable legacy of the last administration is a deterioration in the level of mutual respect and civility among our people, especially when there is political disagreement. I return to the importance of truth and trust because they cannot be overstated. These have become inconvenient values for men and women deemed to be honorable to uphold. And so, the wider society has become more cynical and mistrustful of those who they thought were supposed to serve them. Mr. Speaker, we, on this side, have a job to restore the importance of truth and trust in civilized society. The Year of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, this fiscal year has been deemed the year of infrastructure. We have chosen the area of infrastructure, physical, social, and digital, to improve the delivery of public services to make it more efficient, effective, and responsive. Mr. Speaker, we have skillfully managed this country's public finances well enough to allow us the fiscal space to finance some of the initiatives required to meet the strategic objectives of 24-25. Mr. Speaker, let me remind honorable members that the term infrastructure does not only refer to roads, bridges, drains, culverts, but extends to digital public infrastructure, the civil status registry, e-government services, telecommunications, and government accounts, housing infrastructure, housing and land rationalization, health infrastructure, hospitals and wellness centers, education infrastructure, schools, facilities, and sporting facilities, economic infrastructure, hotels, ports, airports, public buildings, and innovation hubs, agricultural infrastructure, fishing facilities and jetties, social infrastructure, citizen security, and community centers. Digital infrastructure. In a world increasingly driven by technology, St. Lucia is, is enhancing its digital infrastructure across all sectors by harnessing ICT to drive development, innovation, and global competitiveness. Mr. Speaker, the government, through the Department of the Public Service, is undertaking a systematic review of its digital landscape. Current initiatives aimed at enhancing regional connectivity include the Digital Government Integrated Services Platform, DigiGov, the Pro DigiGov Project, 
which streamlines public services through digital platforms and the World Bank-sponsored Caribbean Digital Transformation Project, Digital Caribbean, a major contributor to the country's digital evolution. DigiGov. Mr. Speaker, this year, we are seeking to provide government services through a web-based one-stop one government shop through the DigiGov project to improve efficiency of public service delivery. The integrated digital government services platform is geared towards simplifying procedures and processes while protecting users' privacy. The integrated digital government services platform, DigiGov project, will allow our department to provide online 154 services across eight ministries for a single access point to enable effective and productive collaboration between connected government agencies, businesses, and the public. Mr. Speaker, the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project is, is a project which seeks to improve the region's comparative advantage and to overcome its small size and vulnerabilities. Mr. Speaker, the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project has four priority areas. One, to build resilience to external shocks and support the development of the region's digital economy for economic diversification and greater economic and, and physical resilience. Strengthen and expand the human capacity for world-class professional training, particularly to empower youth with digital skills and competencies in preparation for emerging employment opportunities. Three, leverage the latest technologies that support private sector industry and create opportunities for expansion. The four, the project will also support the adoption of a regionally harmonized and modernized digital environment that will allow for a regional approach to areas such as cybersecurity, data protection, and privacy. The Government Integrated Network. Mr. Speaker, for the Government Integrated Network, connectivity will be expanded to various communities and businesses across the island. The Government Island Wide Network, GINet project, will continue the modernization and provision of broadband internet access to the public free of charge other government services. Mr. Speaker, the government will, up, will upgrade the current budget module on Questica, a modern web-based budgeting solution. This new, this new model will improve the budgeting process for both the Ministry of Finance and line agencies, resulting in more efficient delivery of government services. Government will introduce a new financial management system, Cloud, cloud Suite, which will automate more processes, increase security, and improve, rep rep and improve report accuracy. This system will replace the current financial system, Smart Stream. Mr. Speaker, our tax administration is being upgraded. The goal of the tax administration modernization project is to improve revenue collection and reduce the compliance burden on taxpayers. This upgrade is expected to leverage linkages with other stakeholders, including government agencies and financial institutions. Housing infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the government has taken the decision to leverage the Citizens by Investment Program, CIP, to bring more direct benefits to the people of St. Lucia. This year, we intend to construct houses under the CIP program, as has been done in the other islands. Areas initially earmarked for housing development are <laughs> areas initially earmarked for housing development are Rock Hall. <laughs> well, well, land clearing has commenced in Casaba. Grosley, the National Housing Corporation has received DC approval for the construction of multifamily complexes with 15 two-bedroom apartments with construction to commence this year. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we have secured financing of US $20 million 
from the Import Export Bank of the Republic of China on Taiwan for on lending to St. Lucians to construct new houses or buy residential lots. A new line of credit will be established at the St. Lucia Development Bank to manage this new line of credit. NIPRO is currently in discussion with two developers for the construction of a hundred affordable houses in the Masque area. The project has been modified to include the availability and sale of mill income housing lots. Preliminary road infrastructure work on this project will commence in the next quarter. <clears throat> Land rationalization. Mr. Speaker, on the next phase of the Prague project, we shall, we shall rationalize land and regularize tenure in unplanned developments and facilitate the sale of land at concessionary prices in these areas. Sale of, and sale, sell, sale of land at concessionary prices in these areas. It is estimated that 430 lots will be sold in the newly rationalized areas and those currently occupied will be transferred to the new beneficiaries at subsidized rates. The areas under this program are, are Contonment and POM in OJ, and POM in, in OJ, Contonment and OPCON. Another rationalization project is intended for the displaced occupants of the Tiroche Miku lands to be transferred to reach bar development. The required water, road, and electricity will be taken up by the government. On completion, the rationalization tenure for 12 households will be completed while the remaining house lots will be sold to the public. Mr. Speaker, Invest St. Lucia is undertaking a land rationalization project to regularize occupied lands owned by the corporation. This project seeks to make the land available for purchase at subsidized rates. Some of the areas covered under this project are Denry North, Denry South, Viewfort North, and Viewfort South. Mr. Speaker, it has been said that one of the major social problems in Viewfort is land ownership. In the town of Viewfort, most residents do not own the land on which the houses are built. This year, the government and the parliamentary representative for Viewfort South will embark on discussions with the landowners to address this issue. Mr. Speaker, this year we will recommence work on the rationalization of lands at Bagatelle, which was stopped by the last administration. Health. St. Jude Hospital Reconstruction Project. Health infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, much to the chagrin of the opposition, funding for the rehabilitation of St. Jude Hospital has been secured and con and construction work for the West Wing, kitchen and admin, power, laundry and maintenance building, the new dialysis building and the new physiotherapy building is ongoing. Mr. Speaker, you may, you may recall that the government negotiated a novel loan in the Saudi Development Fund which for the first time included a climate resilience clause. The loan of US 75 million requires competitive tender for supervision and construction of the remaining buildings. The tenders have been evaluated and sent to the Saudi Development Fund for no objection. Upon receipt of a no objection response, construction will commence. In the meantime, discussions between the Saint Jude Hospital Stern Committee are ongoing with the contractor and end users of the facility. Mr. Speaker, it's expected that work on the George Odom Stadium will commence after completing 80% of the construction of St. Jude Hospital, according to the loan agreement. Sufre Hospital. Mr. Speaker, negotiations are well advanced with the investment partners, Caribbean Infrastructure Development, and New Generation Hospital. A proposal to construct a facility to house the new Sufre Hospital has been approved by the government of St. Lucia. Consultations between the Department of Economic Development and the Ministry of Health have been completed. 
The bolt agreement, along with the amortization schedule, the anticipation of the facility, and the other relevant documentation has been submitted to the Attorney General for legal review. The bolt will be for a period of 17 years, with a two-year grace period and a repayment period of 15 years. The cost of the facility is US $31.6 million. US $1 million has been included in the bolt to allow for the replacement of all medical equipment over a seven-year cycle. The site has been cleared to allow for the following activities to take place. Topographical survey, geotechnical analysis, cadastral survey, including building layouts. A social and, and environmental impact assessment will be undertaken in the upcoming year. The facility will provide the following services. Four primary healthcare services, consistent with a district medical facility, mat maternity, maternity services, public health services, day surgery and post-operative care, hyperbaric chamber and related facilities. Old Victoria Hospital. Mr. Speaker, the former Victoria Hospital plant will house the Castries Urban Polyclinic. Services will be augmented to include a range of services not previously provided at the Castries Wellness Center. The secondary care wing. A 12-bedroom secondary care wing with two full bathrooms including facilities for the physically challenged, a new space for pharmacy operations, remodeling of the, nation, of the nursing station, and the installation of medication rooms will be constructed at the refurbished Victoria Hospital site. Construction of the Cuban Eye Clinic Center will commence this year. Construction of the Larissus Wellness Center is being undertaken and will be completed this year. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, in our 2021 manifesto, the Senusian Labour Party pledged to pursue a health policy that is patient-centered, evidence-based, equitable, accessible, and affordable. The centerpiece of this policy is the Universal Health Care Program. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that the implementation of this program is well on the way. I think it's important to inform the House that a framework for implementing a standard-based approach for adolescents has been developed for St. Lucia. This framework seeks to enable the provision of adolescent health services at primary care facilities and within the school, the school health programs. Mr. Speaker, the high cost of the provision of health services by third parties and the private health service providers remains a matter of concern to the government. We have sought to increase the capacity of local health providers by incentivizing the purchase of medical equipment. In this budget, $1 million has been allocated for, study, for further study on the rationalization of the provision of health care services abroad with a view to reducing its costs. We have launched the maternal and child care aspect, the 80-plus the health coverage, and this year we will cooperate cervical and prostate screening chronic kidney disease screening and snake bite management as part of the essential package of health services. These services will be provided free to all registered individuals in our health management system. Free medicines for diabetics and hypertensive patients will also be available under this program. It is the intention of this government that all citizens will possess a health card to access health care services. Mr. Speaker, we have launched the performance-based financing system at eight health centers around the island. This system is intended to access and reward the health services provided by these centers. This program will be expanded this year. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health will outline the progress in the provision of universal health care at the develop developments at the Millennium Heights Complex and other developments in the area of health. Education. Mr. Speaker, the fundamental cure for poverty is not money but knowledge. This timeless doctrine, espoused by Sir Arthur Lewis, remains a guiding principle in the building of our country. We therefore need an educational system that is accessible, relevant, and responsive, 
supported by curriculum development, teacher training, improved leadership, infrastructure improvements, school security, student well-being, and technologically driven infrastructure in education. Mr. Speaker, this year, we will undertake $22.5 million in major repairs and in rehabilitation of schools. This will include $16.28 million from, from the Affinex Bank loan. Major repairs will, will be undertaken at the following schools this year. Cassius Comprehensive School, Bishop, Bishop Charles Gashi, Bishop Charles Gashi, Bishop Charles Gashi School, Enchibo, <laughs> Enchibo Secondary School, <laughs> Leon Hess Comprehensive School, <laughs> Dimpolet Primary School, Faso Combined School, Larry Seuss Combined School, Grand Rivier Secondary School, Beanfield Secondary School, Denry Primary School, Oje Combined School, Piero Combined, Reunion, Reunion Primary, Plain View Combined, and the Viewford Comprehensive and Super Comprehensive Schools. There will be repairs on other schools island-wide, which will be detailed by the Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have commissioned a new facility for care in, in cul-de-sac, financed by a $1 million U.S. grant from the Government of the Republic of India, for which we thank them. This hospitality and catering facility will serve to enhance the skill of students transitioning into the labor market. ICT. Mr. Speaker, in the first phase of digital content development in six subject areas, has been completed. This process was facilitated by local teachers and IT professionals. It's very important, Mr. Speaker. The first phase of digital content development in six subject areas has been completed, and this process was facilitated by local teachers and local IT professionals. Following this, Teachers were trained, and the project is currently being piloted in the classroom. In the coming year, we'll pursue additional subjects until the purchase of textbook will of textbook may no longer be required. Mr. Speaker, we are pursuing smart classrooms at some primary and secondary schools. Over 20 smart classrooms were commissioned were commissioned thanks to the Caribbean Digitalization Transformation Project, Early Childhood Education, to ensure that our young generation is given the best possible start. Nine state-of-the-art early childhood pre-K classrooms have been commissioned, commissioned, and we intend to construct more classrooms primarily in marginalized communities. Work is progressing on the Patience Early Childhood Center. Education, education for matching skills and jobs. Four secondary schools will be transformed into technical and vocational education and training TVET institutions. The Stanley John Odlum Secondary School will now serve as the Institute of Arts, Media and Design. The Grandview Secondary School is currently being transformed into the Institute for Sustainable Agriculture, Culinary Arts and Entrepreneurial Services. The Angier Secondary School will be the Institute for Engineering and Technology, and the PI Secondary School will serve as the Institute of Construction and Heritage. The government's policy of at least one university graduate per household continues with partnerships with friendly governments, Monroe College, and government funding. This year, the opportunity of partnering with 30 institutions will be pursued. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education is focused on fulfilling the mandate given to it by the people of St. Lucia and continues to improve the quality of education to develop a cadre of well-rounded individuals equipped to live and work in St. Lucia. Curriculum strengthening, the teaching of mathematics. Mr. Speaker, 
we are losing our specialized teachers to management positions to the detriment of our students. And so we must address this problem if our students are to, are to improve their performance in mathematics. Government has invested $550,000 to employ eight mathematics specialists to assist in the following schools. Castries, Castries Comprehensive Secondary School, Bishop Charles Gashie School, Enchipo Secondary School, Leon Hess Comprehensive School, Dame Pollard Primary School, Faso Combined, Lavisus Combined, Grand West Secondary, Beanfield Secondary, Denry Primary, Oje Combined, Piero Combined, Reunion Primary, Plain View Combined, and the Viewford Comprehensive and Super Comprehensive School. Review of the Education Act. In January this year, the Department of Education for the EQIP completed the final consultation on the review of the Draft Education Act. This new bill is expected to be tabled in Parliament in the new financial year. School security. Mr. Speaker, we are acutely aware of the influence that gangs are having on our schools. To, co to complement the government's social interventions, particularly for males, the security of our school plant needs strengthening. An audit of the security at schools has recently been concluded with recommendations for consideration. The implementation of the adopted recommendations of the security audit will commence in a phased approach, starting with eight most vulnerable schools. The interventions will include debushing, additional perimeter lighting, upgraded fencing, and camera security systems. Principal assistant programs. Mr. Speaker, in the 2021 manifesto of the St. Lucia Labour Party, we committed to the reintroduction of principal assistant program. In the new academic year, my government has, uh, has allocated 1.18 million towards the implementation of this program on a phased basis across 71 primary schools. Principal assistants will provide principals with the necessary administrative support to allow them more time for their supervisory roles in the schools. Scholarships. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> as, we seek to, <coughs> as we seek to nurture global citizens, the government's policy of at least one university graduate per household is being rolled out for partnerships with friendly governments and locally based universities. This year, an additional 70 students benefited from full or partial scholarships. We continue to explore opportunities to partner with Territory Education in the pursuit of this policy. OECS Skills and Innovation Project. <clears throat> the OECS Skills and Innovation Project, which seeks to strengthen youth skills, employability, improve education opportunity, and foster quality and innovation among the OECS national colleges, will be facilitated at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College and the National Skills Development Center. Mr. Speaker, funds have been allocated for secondary to post-secondary education, for technical support, and to identify and overcome the barriers men and men face in participating in post-secondary education. Total funding for the, for the OECS project is US 19 million. <coughs> Agriculture, repairs to fishing facilities. Mr. Speaker, Work continues on the maintenance of fish landing facilities across the country. This year, upgrades and renovations will be done at Ancillary, Grosile, Denry, Castries, Viewfort, and Souffre. Construction, <coughs> construction of the Miku Jetty is proceeding. 
and and will be and will be completed this year. Ren <laughs> Renovation works will be undertaken at the Bath Propagation Station in Sufre to facilitate the production of cocoa seedlings, some of which have already been distributed to farmers island-wide at a subsidized price of $2 per plant. Mr. Speaker, agriculture continues to be a very important sector, a significant contributor to employment in rural areas. Mr. Speaker, to ensure the future of the food and nutrition security of our country, we have taken measures to develop targeted, innovative, innovative climate change resilient approaches to agricultural production. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia has committed itself to the target of reducing food imports by 25% by the end of 2025. In this regard, St. Lucia seeks to diversify and expand vegetables and food production. To encourage the participation of youth in agriculture, late last year, the Minister of Agriculture led a delegation to Guyana to observe and adopt modern agricultural production techniques using cutting edge technologies. Given the new opportunities in this modern approach to, ag to agriculture, I have allocated $1 million towards this enterprise, which will be managed by the Ministry of Agriculture in collaboration with the Youth Economy Agency. For agriculture to reach its full potential, there is a need to reverse the low level of capitalization and to encourage private sector investment in agriculture. In this regard, the agriculture sector will be listed as an area of enterprise in the macro investment bill scheduled to be passed in Parliament this year. This is intended to supplement the Agricultural Incentives Act and spur greater investment in the sector. Mr. Speaker, in our, in our agricultural diversification drive, several agricultural products have been, have been identified. Vanilla production, cocoa production, honey production, and sea moss production. Mr. Speaker, these products offer novel opportunities for value-added agricultural products for exports. Mr. Speaker, in addition to the ongoing products, there will be a new push towards vanilla production, aquaponics, hydroponics, and new irrigation systems. Bananas. Mr. Speaker, while the export of bananas to the United Kingdom no longer plays a major role in agricultural production, a vibrant and viable market exists in the region. Exports to the region have been increasing, and the government is working with farmers to improve their marketing and to overcome bottleneck shortages in the supply of packaging materials. Youth and sports. Mr. Speaker, this government's history of youth, em of youth empowerment is clear. We are the party of universal primary education, <coughs> universal secondary education, first generation scholarships, one university per household, Darren Sammy Cricket Ground, George Ordnum Stadium, Youth Economy, SEM 5A Skills Up, and a separate Ministry of Youth Development. We are the government that recognized and provided an increased subvention to the National Youth Council, expanded scholarship opportunities, introduced the One Laptop Program, paid facilities for secondary school children, and provided low-cost internet access to homes. It is now no surprise, Mr. Speaker, that we have introduced a semi-professional football league. This is our history, creating opportunities for young people in the boundless world of sports. Mr. Speaker, the application of skills has no boundaries, as long as one is good enough, and we expect that footballers around the island will receive financial rewards for playing in a professional environment. Mr. Speaker, the competent Minister of Sports will be pleased to give further details. Sports infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the International Cricket Council, ICC, has announced St. Lucia as one of the venues to host ICC Men's T20 World Cup in June 2024. In preparation for this international tournament, a local organizing committee, the LOC, has been established with the National Lottery Authority, NLA, 
holding a seat in the committee. Mr. Speaker, this event will attract global attention with opportunities to further promote the, the St. Lucia brand, bringing significant economic benefits to Ireland. Last month, the government of St. Lucia guaranteed a demand installment loan of EC 80 million from the first national bank, St. Lucia Limited, for the National Lottery Association. This loan was granted after rigorous financial analysis and due diligence by the Ministry of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I wish to reiterate that this loan will be used for funding the preparatory loan for the hosting of T20 Cricket World Cup and the funding of NLA's island-wide youth and sports infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that the upgrading and rehabilitation of the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds, the Mindu Philip Park, <laughs> and the Grozile Plain Field have all started and works are ahead of schedule. This project, Mr. Speaker, has provided employment for scores of contractors who have been supervised by a competent local project manager, management firm working in close collaboration with the NLE and the LOC. Mr. Speaker, the work being undertaken demonstrates, demonstrates the government's commitment to improving sporting facilities to the national standards and ensuring a legacy of quality sporting infrastructure for our youth. The National Aquatic Center. Mr. Speaker, plans have been approved by the DCA for the National Aquatic Center and construction will continue this year. The Innovation Hub. Mr. Speaker, in our demonstration of belief in our youth, we will provide initially $500,000 for the establishment of a business innovation hub. This hub will implement programs to attract and retain top engineering and entrepreneurial talent who will be engaged in research and development to develop technologically driven business solutions. In addition, it will create an ecosystem that fosters collaboration among public and private entities and international agencies. Community centers. Mr. Speaker, work has commenced on the Grand Rivier Community Center and the Cul de Sac Community Center. <clears throat> a new community center will be constructed at the junction of Bocage, Mondido, and Egan to serve the, com the communities of Castries North and Castries East. Total construction. <clears throat> Total construction cost is estimated at, at five million with 1.5 million being provided from the Taiwanese grant facility. Equity and social transformation. In 2023, government assistance for social protection programs was increased by 6 million to 26 million. This clearly illustrates the government's commitment to ensuring the provision of relief to the most vulnerable in our society. This year, we will continue to expand existing social protection interventions with new initiatives. Our interventions are intended to reach all demographics in the society in need. The basic life and employable training program have equipped several unemployed at-risk youth with essential job readiness skills. The community after school program has been reinstated and over 400 children are receiving skills training and psychosocial support in preparation for everyday living challenges. The SSDF in the Ministry of Equity has expanded the home care program ensuring that more individuals receive the care that they deserve. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Equity continues to provide to people affected by COVID-19 with over 2,500 people from the informal sector expected to receive grant support of $1,500 each to assist them in their return to normal life. The ministry is also providing parenting programs which will increase the number of persons and increase the number of persons 
under the public assistance program. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the minister and his contribution to the debate will give further details of the, of, about the numerous interventions in his ministry. Allow me, though, to mention some programs which honorable members should be familiar with. Our Boys Matter, Kudme St. Lucie, Hope, <laughs> Hope, St. Lucia Human Capital Res Resistance Program, BNTF 10, Sh Shock Responsive Sh Social Protection Program, Offenders Reintegration Pilot Program. Mr. Speaker, while we provide necessary resources to the police to combat crime, the Ministry of Equity is also involved in a crime violence interruption program aimed at reducing the incidence of crime and violence by addressing the risk factors faced by vulnerable young people. There are three components to this program. Skills training, positive parenting and mentorship, and the Minister will elaborate. Mr. Speaker, facilities for the upkeep, upkeep and care of juveniles have been inadequate for ages. Government will be undertaken to establish of a national service center located at the former George Charles Secondary School to offer development and rehabilitative services to youth. The design and architectural joints for the provision of the center are currently being prepared. Mr. Speaker, this is all part of my government's article of faith to continuously put people first. St. Lucia Social Development Fund. Mr. Speaker, one of the philosophical underpinnings of this administration is to address the needs of the most vulnerable and marginalized in our society. From the onset, our policies and programs have been designed to ensure that successive generations are better off than those that have gone before. It is in this vein, Mr. Speaker, that we have invested heavily in social intervention strategies for the St. Lucia Social Development Fund, SSDF, which seeks to provide educational assistance, housing assistance, hope, short-term employment, elderly care, and human resource development and crime intervention programs. The highlights of these programs are as follows. Education assistance provided to 5,557 households. Housing assistance, 180 households. Our Boys Matter, with the assistance of the private sector, 105 boys on the verge of dropping out of school and engaging in deviant behavior received assistance. Hope, meaning holistic opportunities of personal empowerment. 710 persons received relief under this program with 223 applicants in waiting. Short-term employment, 16,273 people benefited from this program. Home care program, 860 senior citizens have benefited under this program uh, with 574 employees benefiting from UE certified workshops for clients with a range of degenerative diseases. Basic needs trust, the construction of roads now at Goodlands and Bexon have benefited and more this fiscal year. In, in, in the years 2023-2024, Mr. Speaker, 2,242 people benefited from these interventions, which included small-scale housing support, educational assistance, medical assistance, and burial assistance, in addition to other social benefits. The Youth Economy. The Youth Economy Agency, established by the Youth Economy Act, number 17, of 2022 was launched in November 2022. Its principal objective was to convert hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into business with the agency providing access to finance, training and mentorship. The initial capital of the agency was provided by the government of St. Lucia. On June 18, 2023, the board of directors of the Caribbean Development Bank approved the loan to the government of St. Lucia of US 
276,000 or EC 16.8 million and a grant of US 466,200 or EC 1.25 million for the agency. The board, impressed by the Youth Economy Agency initiative, agreed to allow working capital to be financed for enterprises operating under the scheme. The project involves the provision of financing to youth enterprises in the key economic sectors of agriculture, agro-processing, the blue economy, the orange economy, designing, entertainment, modeling, music, sports, literary, and performing arts, writing, and directing, training, and technology. As of March 2024, 597 grants, of which 56% were female, would this would disburse to young people, making a total of $2.81 million. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, it would interest members to note that there are over 1,521 applicants in the system for grants, signaling the level of interest among the young people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, loan disbursements are expected to commence in 2024 with 409 loan grant applications awaiting processing. The Youth Economy Agency has 65 entrepreneurs participating in digital marketing training, 165 in the introduction to business planning, 35 in the mentorship program, and 125 in investment training. From its inception, the Youth Economy Agency has worked closely with the Embassy of the Government of China on Taiwan, which has provided a grant of 1.2 million to the Youth Economy Agency under a technical agreement which will be signed next month. The Youth Economy Agency has clearly been welcomed by the people of St. Lucia, and if the support of the Caribbean Development Bank will continue to have, meaning, to have a meaningful impact on opportunities for our youth. The year will increase its presence in other parts of St. Lucia with the establishment of a desk in the South. In <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we are witnessing an unprecedented surge in local and foreign investment interests. This surge in investments has been enabled by the transparency in its governments, in governments negotiations with investors, and the government placing the interest of St. Lucia first. In this regard, I'm pleased to inform this Honorable House, that during the financial year 24-25, the government will place before Parliament legislation aimed at attracting and facilitating mega investments through special incentives to businesses and sectors which are likely to have a significant, significant impact on the local economy. Investment projects. Mr. Speaker, Invest in Lucia, our premier investment promotion agency, has been working on several projects that will continue into 2025. These projects are expected to increase St. Lucia's high quality room stock to meet the growing increase in stayover arrivals. One, the Courtyard Marriott at Point Seraphim is currently under construction. This hotel includes 140 rooms and suites meeting rooms and facilities, swimming pool, a fitness center, food and beverage outlets, rooftop and rooftop terraces. This hotel will be open by the end of 2025. Total investment, 113 million. At Canel's Miku, construction of two luxury all-inclusive hotels has started and is ongoing. It is proposed that this development will provide 250 rooms and 380 residences. Total investment, one billion. Cabot St. Lucia Grosile. I'm pleased to report that after extensive discussions 
and renegotiations with the developer, this project is expected to provide mutual benefits. Considerable progress has been made in the development. The golf course is competed and operational. The, registered, the residences and clubhouse are slated for construction during 24, 25 and beyond. Total investment, 405 million. The Kazaba Beach Resort in Grozili, a 90, 90 unit hotel to be managed by Hyatt. The first building will be completed by the end of 2024 and will, be, and will be open to guests while work commences on the second building. Completion date for this hotel is scheduled in 2025. Total investment, 31.8 million. Sanders, the new rooms at Halcyon Beach are complete and a new village concept at the Sanders Regency Latok compri comprising 20 suites is under construction and is expected to be completed in 2024. Total cost, 68 million. Secret Sports and Spa St. Lucia. Work on the renovation, refurbishment, and revitalization of the former 234 room St. James Club is continuing. It's expected that this project will be completed in the last quarter of 2024 or early 2025. Total investment, 21.6 million, 216 million. Mr. Speaker, please note, the construction of all the above projects is ongoing. Construction is ongoing. There are more hotel projects that are being negotiated with many sword turning ceremonies to be held by year end. These include the Grand Hyatt Hotel in Swabisha in Shozel. It will finally begin with a new investor. Roadworks on a new bypass will begin next month and the formal sword turning ceremony will be held by the end of May this, this year. Total investment, 810 million. Alia Resort and Spa St. Lucia at Mont Piment. This project comprises several phases of development. The master plan proposes a mix of resorts, adults only, and family, residential condos and villas, commercial and availability of public spaces that cater to the needs of the community and surrounding areas. The other component, component is the Life Co Wellbeing Center, an international wellness company. The sorting ceremony is proposed next month. Total investment, 2.3 billion. Cut the web at Black Bay Library, an ultra luxury hotel with 80 keys, 40 villas and residences. Total investment, 498 million. A resort development on the Ridby Beach. After months and months of protracted negotiations, Sunwin, Sunwin Group, Royalton, and Rex Resort Group will finally begin construction of a 500-room ultra-luxurious resort offering both European plan and an all-inclusive accommodation options. Mr. Speaker, this is a bittersweet moment as 500 rooms will become unavailable on the market because the investor has informed that Starfish Hotel will be closed and demolition will commence. Mystic will be closed at the end of July and demolition, and demolition will commence by September 1st. Construction work will commence next year. Total investment, 540 million. <coughs> Rodney Bay Marina, Pope site. <coughs> On Sunday, 21st April 2024, was the official sorting ceremony for phase one of this project. This development will include the following. 102 room hotel, 20 condominium units, bars and restaurants, offices, a supermarket, a cineplex, cineplex jetties, and a broadwalk. The development will also host the headquarters for Republic Bank. Total investment, 320 million. Other investments. GPH, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, 
This investment will see the upgrade of port castries and Sufre waterfront. This project will require judging at Point Seraphin, the building of a boardwalk from San Susi to the Vendors Arcade, rebuilding and expanding the Vendors Arcade, building of finger pairs at the arcade, demolition of the old customs building, and rebuilding of a new customs building, creation of parking lots, construction of a fisherman's village at Banan, and, and the total upgrade of the Soufre waterfront. Total investment, 145 million. Say Gastronomy Restaurant in Viewfort has now fully expanded into its existing space in Viewfort as an artisan restaurant and food distribution center. The owners have purchased adjoining lands to build more modern storage and warehousing facility to complement the expansion of their business. Construction is to commence this year. In the BPO sector, ITEL CX will expand its operations in St. Lucia with the occupation of an additional building in the free zone. In the free zone. Ascension International Limited, the island's first locally owned BPO KPO operation, has opened in Sufre, offering back office support to a US based corporation. Mr. Speaker, you will agree that opportunities abound for employment and wealth creation for the people of this country. In my presentation, I have only mentioned major investments. Other investments will be outlined by the minister in his presentation. <coughs> Citizen security. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the first responsibility of any government is the safety and protection of the citizens. All their rights and privileges depend on it. Mr. Speaker, the details of the nature and extent of police equipment and resources are a matter of national security and should never be compromised by careless comments by people who should know better. Mr. Speaker, I repeat. The details of the nature and extent of police equipment and resources are a matter of national security and should never be compromised by careless comments by people who should know better. Mr. Speaker, allow me to articulate the level of infrastructure support we have already provided to the police. Note, Mr. Speaker, as I said, for national security and confidentiality reasons, the details will not be outlined. Repairs to police facilities, 2.7 million. Purchase of firearms and ammunition, 270,000. Furniture, furniture equipment, appliances and other equipment, 550,000 vehicles, 5.1 million trade traffic pilot project and police visibility and body vehicle camera systems, 580 million other equipment, 580,000 other equipment, 585,000 even musical instruments for the police, 70,000. In terms of major renovations and additions, over 4.5 million has been spent on the sovereign divisional headquarters and 3.7 million for the renovation of the drug squad building in the north. In terms of major infrastructural work, the northern divisional headquarters is progressing smoothly. The project will be constructed in two parts an administrative block and a dormitory with gym facility with gym facility a lawn tennis court the total the, the, the total cost is expected to be 45 million built through a bolt agreement with NIPO custody suites Mr. Speaker our police have long complained about the inadequacy of holding facilities for arrested individuals. 
after the last government's callous destruction of the custody suites holding facility, there is an urgent need to remedy this situation for the exercise of just treatment of accused persons. And so, Mr. Speaker, we are now retrofitting one of the buildings on Upper Bridge Street, which previously housed part of the Central Police Station, with nine holding cells and other facilities at a cost of over $4.5 million. Other interventions. The Forensic Lab. Mr. Speaker, the government continues to fight crime, making use of the most up-to-date scientific equipment available. In June 2023, the government received a contribution of $417,000 towards procuring a ballistic comparison microscope. The equipment was acquired in March 2024. This equipment will enable side-by-side -side comparison of bullets using fire-related investigations. In September 2023, the DNA unit completed its ISO 1725 audit and accreditation was awarded in December 2023, meaning that all testing activities at the laboratory are now designated as accredited services. In October 2023, the forensic lab was launched as a center of excellence in forensic science. Swift Justice. Mr. Speaker, the Swift Justice Project, promised in my first budget, budget address, is finally beginning to see some progress. I have been informed that the building has been identified to accommodate three additional courtrooms, two trial courts, and one chamber court. Provision for the procurement of essential equipment and retrofitting of the building has been provided for in this budget. House of Justice. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, on Friday, April 19, 2024, four days ago, we turned the sword to, to signify the commencement of the construction of the House of Justice. Mr. Speaker, this building will be constructed under both arrangement with NH International as a, as a contractor and financer, with NIPO providing project management services. The board will entail a lease agreement with the government of St. Lucia. The expected cost of the facility is US $54 million. Mr. Speaker, this arrangement will not increase the national debt of the country, nor will it require a loan guarantee from the government of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the new structure will occupy the abandoned courthouse building and the abandoned education building. The geotechnical survey for the site has been completed and an environment and social impact assessment is in progress to inform ways of mitigating disruption during construction. Mr. Speaker, this building will certainly enhance architectural aesthetics of the city. Mr. Speaker, unlike the last administration, we engage the Solution National Trust for guidance and their concerns, if any, about the demolition of the two buildings that we need, that we need to accommodate the new structure. An application has been made to the DCA for the demolition of the buildings. Police headquarters. Mr. Speaker, work will commence this year on the new police headquarters, which will be situated at the request of the police on Upper Beach Street, the original location. A concept note will be prepared after discussing with the police and relevant ministries. This concept note will be the basis of a bold arrangement for which several developers have already expressed interest. Police training. Mr. Speaker, this government has reinstated the police training vote with $450,000. <clears throat> Several police officers will continue to receive training abroad in the USA, in Taiwan, in the United Kingdom, in the, and the OECS countries, including Jamaica. 70 new recruits will be trained and enlisted this year. <clears throat> this Illusion Development Fund and government have partnered and, and, con and with contributions with social groups and NGOs on crime suppression initiatives. We intend to intensify this initiative this year. The Alliance for Community Transformation Act 
<coughs> Mr. Speaker, the Lands for Community Transformation Act was launched in January 2024. The Act initiative provides a practical framework for the holistic approach to crime risk reduction and prevention. This agency brings together support services, counseling, education, educational interventions, community outreach, crime prevention programs, law enforcement, and economic activities, opportunities that are easily accessible to the youth at the community level. Mr. Speaker, we have strengthened our laws regarding gun violence and the illegal possession of guns. We urge law enforcement personnel to make maximum use of these existing laws, including the gang law, and to leave no stone, stone unturned in ensuring the enforcement of the law. Mr. Speaker, it is our belief that there should be a societal approach to crime prevention while we continue to provide resources to the police in their fight against crime, we will continue to work with civil society groups to deal with the root causes of crime. The Interagency Intelligence Committee, the IAIC, which formerly comprised representatives from the police, customs, and the FIA, is in the process of being formalized and restructured to include representatives from the prison, ports, and inner revenue department in order to ensure a more effective and greater collaborative approach to fighting crime. Mr. Speaker, we will continue the improvement to the physical infrastructure of the bodily correctional facility. And, and in addition, we seek to improve the general conditions of workers and prison facilities to allow for effective rehabilitation of inmates. My government is fully committed to ensuring that all citizens are able to enjoy a safe environment so that they can realize their full human potential. Mr. Speaker, while the first responsibility of the government is the safety of its citizens, it is not the exclusive responsibility. As a country, we have a collective responsibility to provide for the safety of each other. When the safety of our country is compromised on account of crime, we are negatively affected, and therefore, a collective response is required. Those on the front line in the fight against crime must therefore have our fullest support and cooperation. Those who seek to do otherwise cannot be deemed to have the best interest of our country. This is why my government has been so heavily supportive of the work of the police to assist with the effectiveness of a crime reduction strategy, I have appointed a minister with responsibility for crime prevention, with the objective, with the objective of working with all parties, including political parties, to prepare a multifaceted and comprehensive national plan to address the growing citizen security challenges. Mr. Speaker, in addition to our local law enforcement, we have drawn on the support and services, of, and services of international partners like the USA, the UK, Taiwan. We also have drawn on the resources and expertise of the regional security services, which has cost the government of St. Lucia over $700,000 between March 2023 and August 2023. Mr. Speaker, I, am, I have publicly stated that I'm ready to accept or advise discussion and information to help curb the surge of violence in St. Lucia. There are some in, in our society for their own political reasons who pretend that they have all the answers and simple consultations are a remedy for the crime issues in St. Lucia. The issues are complex and the, distinc and the distinction must be made between enforcement and operations, which is the purview of the police, enforcement and security operations, which is the purview of the police, and other inventions, which are the responsibility of civil society working with the police. Tactical and strategic criminal operations by the police cannot be a matter for public discussion. Once more, I call on the population to assist the police in the execution of their duties and the police in turn 
to earn the population's trust and confidence. <clears throat> Infrastructure, roads. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, when we announced 2024 as the year of infrastructure, we made it clear that it was not only about roads. However, roads are an important part of the infrastructure of a nation. Mr. Speaker, the road network in our country needs an upgrade. A preliminary costing from the Ministry of Infrastructure indicates that over $400 million will be required for comprehensive upgrade and repair of our road network. $400 million. Mr. Speaker, the road network problem is compounded by most developers' failure to meet their obligations to build roads that are of the required standards. Mr. Speaker, Grosily, the most populous region, will require road repairs and upgrades costing over $100 million. Mr. Speaker, Funding these roads from local revenue or traditional loan funding sources will negatively impact our debt-to-GDP ratio. Hence, the government has entered negotiations with a private sector developer to fund, in the first instance, $200 million towards our road development program. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, you may ask, how could that be funded without borrowing? Mr. Speaker, the Minister has skillfully used our CIP program started in 2016 when the people of St. Lucia made our CIP program, Mr. Speaker, started in 2016 when the people of St. Lucia made up their minds that same year to change the government of the day. In 2016, St. Lucia was not actively engaged in the CIP program. Between 2016 and 2021, the rules governing our CIP program had changed. St. Lucia's only significant project under the real estate option was the Range Hotel. That hotel failed to materialize, costing taxpayers $12 million and is now located in another island. Mr. Speaker, in December 2023, this government introduced an infrastructure option to complement the other funding options. The new infrastructure option requires developers to raise the financing, uh, the financing needed to undertake approved projects in a number of selected areas and recover the expenses through the CIP program. This means, Mr. Speaker, that improvement in the road network community development projects and housing can be implemented to improve the lives of our people without increasing the debt burden of the country. <coughs> in the first instance, and Mr. Speaker, our members must note that in the first instance, the first instance being this, this week or next week. <coughs> In the first instance, Mr. Speaker, we intend to start work immediately on Bosejou, Viesikwe, Chose, Zabo to Bellevue Road, <laughs> and Bagatelle. <laughs> All roads constructed will be supervised and certified by the Ministry of Infrastructure. Other details, and Mr. Speaker, the Minister has a lot of details under this program will be given by the Minister. Other funding. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> during my presentation of the estimates, I indicated that because of the government's prudent cash management and the vibrant performance of the economy, the government paid $60 million to settle DFC obligations before the due date for settlement in 24-25. Mr. Speaker, 
the usual maintenance of roads, clearing of culverts, and the silting will continue this year at a sum of $16 million for which an allocation has been made in the budget. Mr. Speaker, plans for the reconstruction of the Grosley Highway, recklessly abandoned by the former government, will commence this year. We have allocated a sum of $8.5 million while we await final approval from the QAT Fund. Mr. Speaker, a sum of $3 million has been allocated to commence preliminary work on the short bridge. There are several new inno innovative ideas and options for the construction of the Cassius Grosley Highway which are being explored. Millennium Highway. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I've expressed on many occasions my dissatisfaction with the progress on work of the Millennium Highway. This slow progress of work has become a source of national embarrassment, especially with the bridge built by JICA over a year ago and is yet to be commissioned. Mr. Speaker, it is with some guarded relief that work is progressing on the cul-de-sac roundabout and the Millennium Highway. Work, work on the second phase of this project, cul-de-sac to answer it, has commenced and we require the construction of 31 retaining walls along the route between the two locations. Plan three, phase three of the project, the construction of the Ansari Bridge has commenced. Mr. Speaker, it is intended that the rehabilitation of the road works from Ansari to Sufre will be part of the additional two phases. Mr. Speaker, let me inform on rebel members that the contract for this road was negotiated, tendered, and awarded under the last government. However, I have been informed by officials of the Ministry of, of Economic Development, and I quote, that the project has exceeded its initial costing. Therefore, a financing gap of 27.12 million exists, end of quote, meaning that at present prices, there is already a cost overrun of $27 million on this project. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, given the experiences of projects, quality and time, a planning and design unit will be established to provide additional support staff to ensure better oversight of projects to allow for an improvement in the rate of implementation <clears throat> and the quality of project outputs. This unit will also provide technical assistance and support to the existing staff of the Ministry of Infrastructure. He won no international airport. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, last year I informed that we had taken a decision to construct a scaled down version of the existing design to obtain a single story structure consisting of a terminal building with a reduced footprint on the already constructed foundation. The final design for the terminal building, including detailed joints, has been completed with tenders to be invited soon. Mr. Speaker, construction of the air traffic tower is in progress and work on the seventh of the 10th floor building is ongoing. Mr. Speaker, the last government approved the direct award to the contractor, to a contractor, which included an 8% fee for securing the finance without bill of quantities for the project. Mr. Speaker, moving forward, there is need to carefully examine these arrangements. Saint, Mr. Speaker, St. Lucians will no longer be exposed to the recklessness association associated with the construction of arguably the largest infrastructure project without an agreed bill of quantities, which would have indicated the likely cost of the project. Mr. Speaker, the designs for the rehabilitation of the runway is expected to be completed this year. Other works will include the modernization of the airfield, drainage system, navigation system, and airfield and ground lighting systems. Let me assure you, Mr. Speaker, that the government is committed to the improvement of the Vanero International Airport and Runway. As we speak, there are works going on to help improve the situation as the existing terminal. The Disaster Vulnerability Project. 
Mr. Speaker, the Disaster Variability Project, DVRP, the largest World Bank, <coughs> the Disaster Variability Reduction Project, the largest World Bank finance investment undertaken by the government of St. Lucia has ended. It is worthy to note that this project started under the Labour Party administration in 2014 and has now come to an end in 2024 under the Labour Party administration. <clears throat> Over 100 projects costing US 76.04 million were executed. Some of the major achievements, recent achievements of these projects were the PI Bridge, the PI and Roblo Community Center, soap stabilization hopes, strengthening of school facilities, health centers, application of flash flood guidance systems, reconstruction of the Blasher Community Center. <coughs> the National Northern Cemetery Project. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the National Northern Cemetery Project will be located at Diglo to adjust the very limited burial state available at shock castries. $1.5 million will be initially spent, will be spent on this project this year. The St. Lucia Fire Service. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> while fire service personnel performed beyond the call of duty during the COVID-19 crisis, it became clear that the capacity of the fire service needed strengthening. The CDB funded fire service project has commenced and is, and is intended to improve the capacity and efficiency of the fire service and first responders to reduce the vulnerability of the population in case of natural and man-made disasters. The program comprises, one, engineering and construction related services and infrastructure works on the reconfiguration and retrof retrofitting of the St. Lucia Fire Service practical training ground to satisfy TV standards. Two, purchase of appliances, one aerodrome truck, five domestic fire trucks, four quick response vehicles, four ambulances and equipment and tools, and equipment and tools for nine fire stations, including two crash fire halls at George F. L. Airport and Iwanora Airport, and the purchase of information communication technology equipment and furniture for the St. Lucia Fire Service, gender-based institutional training and development, mental health and psychosocial support for firefighters and first responders, development of an operations manual to guide fire chiefs and officers to improve operations, capacity building, technical training for 329 fire officers in the use of fire appliances, quick response vehicles, aerodrome trucks, and breathing apparatus. These activities have been undertaken for a loan of US 9 million and grant funding of US 233,000 from the CDB's Special Reserve Fund. The project is expected to be completed by December 2025. The West Coast Fire Service Substation. Mr. Speaker, this year we will retrofit an existing building to serve as a West Coast Fire Substation to serve the people of Ansari, Canaries, and the surrounding areas. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, tourism. Tourism continues to be St. Lucia's main economic driver. To encourage and enable wider participation of solutions in the tourism industry, we have undertaken several initiatives focusing on certification, training, and research. We continue to build the legal enabling environment for this industry with the enactment of the, of the Community Tourism Bill and the Tourism Development Bill. In the upcoming fiscal year, the St. Lucia Tourism Authority intends to undertake several strategic initiatives aimed at enhancing and sustaining St. Lucia's competitive presence on the international stage. This will include the use of artificial intelligence in our marketing campaigns to determine visitor preferences and behaviors in the various subsectors of the industry. Mr. Speaker, the Community Tourism Agency aims to strengthen the capacity of our communities to achieve the stated objective of spreading the benefits of tourism to as many communities and people as possible. The three projects, the Castries Box Park, 
the Schulzel Arts and Crafts Center, and the Grosley Beach Park are expected to be completed this year. Recreational spaces will be revitalized as the ministry aims to remedy overcrowded beaches. These upgraded spaces <coughs> will focus on Redwi, Buckeye Beach, Ans Ferry, Lookout Point, and Marigo Bay. Under the Ubeck project, the construction of an underwater sculpture park along the west coast is being proposed. Redevelopment of the Mon Lebai will commence next month. Other projects for the, for the communities include the Prales Seamoss Experience, the revival of the Denry Seafood Fiesta, and the Mata Shrine at the Minor Basilica. Mr. Speaker, the construction of the Martian Artisan Village, Amphieta Serenity Park, and the improvements to lookout points in Sufre, Canaries, and Ansari are all designed to enhance the experience for local visitors for locals and visitors alike. National Conservation. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the National Conservation Authority has been transferred to the, to the Department of Tourism to facilitate the efforts to improve the recreational and environment and environmental health and safety of our beaches for locals and visitors al alike. This year, there will be several targeted initiatives to enhance the work of the NCA. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the Rangers unit will be reinstated, deploying specialized officers at key touristic sites like the Rodney Bay Strip and the Grosley Day Street Party to address security concerns and visitor harassment. These measures are intended to create a safer and more enjoyable environment for all locals and visitors while ensuring the long-term preservation of St. Lucia's natural beauty. In addition, roving teams will be established, tasked with maintenance and beautification in targeted areas. As part of enhancing the recreational experience of locals and cruise passengers at our public beaches, vending and toilet facilities will be established at Radio Park and Mont Pima, at Radio Beach and Mont Pima. These initiatives will, will be ongoing with the intention of including all major beaches in the island. Creative industries and culture. Mr. Speaker, we remain committed to the development and modernization of our creative and cultural industries. <clears throat> our current cultural policy needs updating, requiring innovative ways of harnessing our, creati our creativity for the sustainable and preservation of our culture and traditions. In concert with updating our cultural policy, we shall enact new legislation that will provide the framework for St. Lucia's creative and cultural development. This year, an increased allocation has been given to the Cultural Development Foundation to broaden its program of activities. Special attention will be given to the following. Rebuild the interest of our youth in steel pan. As part of the development of youth interest in steel pan, the ministry will provide facilities for the Diamond Steel Pan Orchestra in Marshall. Training will also be available in lyric writing to assist writers in, in improving their woodcraft and composition of calypso and soccer tunes. Develop advanced technical knowledge and skills in choreography, in choreography and dance. Mr. Speaker, we shall continue to maintain the uniqueness of our culture by, give, by giving greater prominence to our flower festivals, emancipation, celebration, emancipation celebrations and the display of our visual and literacy arts in public places. <coughs> Blue bonds. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, last year I informed this Honorable House that St. Lucia was embarking on the issuance of a blue bond to support projects aimed at achieving sustainable development goal number six, clean water and sanitation, and sustainable development goal number 14, life below water. I am pleased to report that at COP28 in December 2023, the Honorable Sean A. Edwards, Minister of Education, Sustainable Development, 
innovation, science, technology, and vocational training launched our Blue Bond Framework before the International Financial Committee. The framework is among the first to be aligned with the recently launched Global Practitioner's Guide for Bonds to Finance the Sustainable Blue Economy. The framework benefited from the technical advice of the Global Green Growth Institute and Ocean Stewardship Coalition of United Nations Global Compact. St. Lucia's Blue Bond Framework will enable it to issue blue bonds in the near future that will deliver environmental, social, and economic benefits that align with our national adaptation plan, national determined contributions, and SDG Sustainable Development Goal targets. In 2024, we aim to complete the Blue Bond issuance process to operationalize our blue economy ambitions and to sustainably leverage our ocean-based resources to support post-pandemic recovery and economic diversification in accordance with our national oceans policy. Mr. Speaker, we are working closely with our legal, financial, and technical advisors to identify key projects that can be funded using the bond proceeds, including a much-needed wastewater treatment plant for, cast, for the Castries Basin, <coughs> commerce and industry. Mr. Speaker, the private sector must be the main driver of economic activity, with government playing a supportive role. Through the Ministry of Commerce, the government will ensure an enabling environment where businesses and enterprises operate free of unfair competition, high transaction costs, and in low levels of bureaucracy. Mr. Speaker, all members are aware that the government cannot create sufficient employment opportunities for the population. Some categories of business face special challenges, challenges in securing the necessary financing to grow by virtue of their size. This is why the government secured a loan of $10 million from the Caribbean Development Bank to provide COVID financial relief to micro, small, and medium enterprises. Under the loan agreement, the MSME owners from 41 to 60 years old stand to benefit from a loan grant facility available for the concessionary grant of 70 grants and 30 loans. MSMEs in agriculture, agro-processing, agro-tourism, manufacturing, beauty, wellness, and creative industries are eligible for loan grants ranging from 10,000 to 20,000. The project is being implemented over a 24-month period and was launched in March 2023. As of 1st of January 2024, 193 applications have been approved for disbursement by the St. Lucia Development Bank, of which 172 applications were received, totaling disbursements of $2.8 million. To provide technical assistance to these MSMEs, the Organization of American States partnered with the Ministry of Commerce to provide training and assistance in business plan development and assessment. Cannabis. Mr. Speaker, the Regulated Substance Bill intended to create the legal framework for the commercialization of cannabis was enacted in November 2023. Regulations to support the Cannabis Bill are being developed. Mr. Speaker, several foreign companies have reached out to the Cannabis Task Force expressing interest in the industry. Mr. Speaker, we urge local interested entrepreneurs and businesses to ensure that they are not left behind in this emerging industry. The draft Cannabis Bill has been completed and is available for discussion from interested parties. Mr. Speaker, a regulated substance regime will introduce an environment of safety and regulations for several substances. Cannabis cultivation is expected to benefit from the medicinal use from a wider health care industry. <clears throat> the positive effects of cannabis are expected to be realized in many forms within the healthcare industry where many will benefit. Cooperatives. 
The Community Society is receiving assistance, and this year, the non-financial sector will benefit from a solarization project aimed at the conversion to renewable energy to reduce operation costs. The Cooperative, the cooperative Society's Bill 2022 was tabled in Parliament and is expected to be debated and enacted in this new session of Parliament. Export St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, Export St. Lucia has devised and received approval for a national export strategy aimed at coordinating export promotion across government agencies and private and sector organizations. Moreover, priority export sectors have been identified, received the necessary support to enhance output. The national export strategy has successfully expanded St. Lucia's exports. Export gains have been made in value-added agriculture, like seamoss, coconuts, biofertilizers, ap apiculture, which have created additional employment and foreign exchange for the island. Mr. Speaker, Export St. Lucia has been successful and has been actively targeting new markets for its trade mission and continues to be well placed. <coughs> St. Lucia Marketing Board. Mr. Speaker, last year, the St. Lucia Marketing Board was provided with a subvention by the central, by central government, which helped in rebuilding critical infrastructure, re-establishing procurement relationships with sectors, businesses and hotels, and launching a certified program for staff and training of farmers to improve quality standards towards obtaining HACCP certification. The St. Lucia Marketing Board is well on its way to position itself as a premier supplier of quality products, increasing demand for local products. Citizens by Investment Program. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, you may have heard about the commotion surrounding the signing of a memorandum of agreement by Caribbean countries with the exclusion of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, let me state again, and let me state clearly, that St. Lucia fully supports the actions of the four countries which signed the MOA. Our commitment to regional cooperation and collaboration is genuine. We agreed with every provision of the MOA except for the immediate increase of the minimum investment level. Mr. Speaker, we have just signed contracts that will significantly enhance our infrastructure, including roads, housing, and community facilities. These contracts, which require developers to secure financing for execution in advance of recouping the expenditure, were based on arrangements that predated the signing of the MOA. We cannot, in good conscience, change these contractual agreement arrangements in any fundamental matter. Mr. Speaker, the islands that have signed the agreement have been able to build roads, to build houses, to build community centers, and reduce their public debt from the CIP. And I'm pleased that they were able to do so. But we are the last to have adopted the program and have benefited the least. Mr. Speaker, my first priority is to the people of St. Lucia. And so I need to do what is best, what is in the best interest of the country and its people. Mr. Speaker, in the spirit of compromise, we had requested a grandfather clause to allow us to fulfill our existing obligations, as I earlier articulated, but this was refused. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia still believes 
that the best approach to solving our regional challenges is through collaborative action. And we will continue to work in that spirit. Let me assure you, Mr. Speaker, that our CIP program is anchored by robust due diligence processes at every stage and complemented by robust due diligence processes by the financial institutions involved in facilitating the CIP. We will continue, Mr. Speaker, to strengthen processes when necessary and aim to be the first in the rankings of global citizen programs. <coughs> External affairs, foreign policy. When this SLP government came into office, we announced that in our international relations, we would be pursuing a foreign policy that will support our developmental priorities for a reaffirmation of our ties with our traditional friends, but at the same time for establishments of new friendships. We continue to adhere to this policy. Our South-South relationship has become very important, recently manifested by the establishment of loan agreements between St. Lucia and the Saudi, uh, the Saudi Arabian Fund with the Afri and the African Export Bank. We will be unveiling a new strategy towards the African continent and to bring to, to fruition a new policy of economic diplomacy, we will be appointing a number of trade ambassadors. <clears throat> Regional integration for the OECS and CARICOM is and will continue to be a cornerstone of our foreign policy. During last year, St. Lucia joined the sister CARICOM member states in the initiative to find a solution to the constitutional and security crisis in Haiti. Our former Prime Minister, Dr. Kenny D'Antoni, chaired the Eminent Persons Group to assist the heads of government to finally broker with Haitian stakeholders a solution to the political crisis. We shall continue to pursue close co collaboration in the areas of health and security with our neighboring French territories of Martinique and Guadeloupe. St. Lucia holds its friendship and relationship with the government and the people of the Republic of China, Taiwan in the highest esteem and will and will and will continue to support the government and people of Taiwan in their struggle to be accorded the rightful place in the national community. In the same vein, we call for the removal of the, of the U.S. embargo on Cuba and Venezuela. Finally, as you affirm our relationship with our traditional friends during the forthcoming fiscal year, we'll open a high commission in Ottawa, Canada. St. Lucia, St. Lucia will continue to support the call for reparations for the transatlantic slave trade. Diaspora Investment Bill. Mr. Speaker, the Aspen Investment Bill spoken of last year, which intends to encourage first and second generation people of St. Lucian descent living in the diaspora to invest in St. Lucia will be enacted. Fiscal policy. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as we contemplate on the World Bank review of our economic ratings, the government continues to take measures to strengthen the economy and reduce the overall deficits. We have successfully returned 
to primary and current surpluses. To further achieve fiscal sustainability, we will undertake the following policy measures. To enhance the collection of tax revenue by ensuring higher levels of tax compliance and efficiency. This year, the operations of the Inner Revenue Department will be modernized through the innovative use of ICT. We have enabled greater transparency in our debt management by enacting the Debt Management Act on April 1, 2024. In addition, we will, we will streamline our public procurement to ensure greater efficiency and accountability. We'll implement the Public Debt Management and Finance Act, and we have approved the public finance management regulations to enhance the budget process, revenue projection, budget reports, and financial management operation procedures. We'll modernize our banking system and the credit union sector through new legislation. Mr. Speaker, given the implications and impact of climate change, we have adopted a comprehensive approach to addressing mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage by enacting the Climate Change Bill. Embedded in this bill is consideration for conceptual sectorial policies. Energy. Cabinet has approved a national energy policy with the objective of increasing renewable energy generation and decarbonization of thermal and transport systems. The national energy policy will be supported by new relevant legislation. Insolvency. This year, we'll enact the bankruptcy and insolvency bill to address distressed businesses and the management of non-performing loans and insolvency proceedings. Micro, small, and medium enterprises to improve access to finance and types of collateral security available, we have enacted the Security Interest Immovable Property Act, which will reform the institutional framework for the use of immovable property as collateral and the establishment of an immovable property registry. Within the management framework, Mr. Speaker, we intend to continue to reduce waste, deter corrupt practices, and improve productivity levels. Mr. Speaker, these initiatives is, are designed to place the welfare of our people first. Mr. Speaker, we are determined to maintain this growth trajectory. As preliminary estimates show, St. Lucia's GDP grew by 2% this year, 2023. Mr. Speaker, the growth rate for 2022 has been revised from 18.5 to 20% and in 2021 to 11.5%, an indication of three years consecutive, three consecutive years of economic growth. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the economic policies. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we intend to pursue the following economic policies to continue to achieve sustainable economic growth and wealth creation for our people. A new macro investment bill. Mr. Speaker, foreign direct investment has returned. Foreign direct investment has returned in an impressive way. <clears throat> we are however concerned that the granting of approvals for significant investments are too lengthy. This year, we enact legislation that will fast track the approvals of large investments in all sectors, which meet certain economic, environmental, and social criteria. Urban renewal. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this government intends to revive the city and encourage urban renewal. The construction of the Halls of Justice is expected to provide the impetus for this renewal process. Special incentives will be made available to businesses and property owners in the city to renovate and refurbish their properties. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, allowing the city of Cassius to decay will create social problems that will further destroy the aesthetics of our capital city. We will also explore means to discourage the practice of abandoned and unkempt properties, especially those that pose security risks 
and a hazard to people and the environment. Mr. Speaker, I intend to meet with the Chamber of Commerce, National Insurance Corporation, the Castries Constituency Council, the churches, and other relevant authorities to formulate strategic interventions for the city's revival. Project implementation units. Mr. Speaker, to augment the effectiveness of our infrastructure program, we will create two project implementation units, one at the Ministry of Infrastructure and the other at the Office of the Prime Minister. We are confident, confident that these units will increase the rate of project implementation. <clears throat> Minimum wage. Mr. Speaker, part of the core values of the St. Lucia Labour Party are equity, respect for the rule of law, and inclusiveness. The governing principles of the St. Lucia Labour Party are rooted in its history. It is the political party that has enfranchised the working class in St. Lucia. The St. Lucia Labour Party has always demonstrated that it is the party that cares and respects the dignity of the St. Lucian people. Our party founder and first chief minister, Sir George F. L. Charles, was the architect of adult suffrage and a representative of workers for the trade unions. It was his vision that led to the creation of the protection of wages audience and holidays with pay ordinance in 1959. Mr. Speaker, a true historical account will also indicate that Sir John Compton and the late Maurice Mason between 1964 and 1969 were both influential figures in support of Sir George F. L. Charles's legislative agenda on the rights of workers. It is our responsibility, Mr. Speaker, as the party in government, to, con to continue pursuing our founder's vision, to keep improving the wages and conditions of the workers of this country. This is why, in 2022, we appointed a minimum and equal wages commission comprising representatives of the trade unions, private sector, and government. I'm pleased to report, Mr. Speaker, that this commission has completed its preliminary report and the way forward will be as follows. In compliance with the provision of the Labor Act, CAP 16.04, the commission shall proceed to prepare the draft order containing a recommended minimum wage for publication in the Gazette and to present its recommendations to the representatives of employees and employers as prescribed by the Labour Act. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Section 77 of the Labour Act prescribes the manner in which the Commission is to seek comments, and I quote, when there is such a referral, the Commission by publication in the Gazette and, sub and submission to organizations representing employees and employers invite comments and objections relating to the making of a minimum wage order within 21 days of publication. And on the issue of objections, section 87 reads as follows. Objections to the making of a minimum wage order shall be submitted to the minister, stating A, the grounds of objections, B, the nature of that person's objections in that manner, and C, such additions, modification, or amendments to the draft order that the person may think fit. Mr. Speaker, it is our hope and our desire to follow the rules that St. Lucian workers will have a new minimum livable wage by August 1st, 2024.
early childhood education, a one-off payment of $2,500 will be made to each of the 93 privately registered early childhood centers to assist with the purchase of educational supplies. This payment will be made from 1st August 2024. Relief, relief for banana farmers. Banana farmers recently affected by the shortage of boxes and packaging material will be entitled to a shared compensation made available by the government of $500,000. This compensation package will be administered by the Ministry of Agriculture. Housing relief for public servants. Public servants will be entitled to 100% residential mortgages under the US $20 million Exim Bank new credit line facility being managed by the St. Lucia Development Bank. In, a, in addition, the government will assist every successful applicant with a 1,000 payment towards the legal costs. Import duty on hybrid vehicles. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with our commitment to climate change adaptation and mitigation, we have received approval from CARICOM for the derogation of the import duty on hybrid electric vehicles, EVs. This means that the import duty on these vehicles will continue to be 5% until November 2025. We'll continue to review concessions and incentives available for all forms of renewable forms of energy. Increase in pensions. Mr. Speaker, are you aware that there are government pensioners and other pensioners in this country who own $300 a month pension? <clears throat> Effective August 1st, 2024, the minimum pension payable to government pensioners will be increased to $725. <laughs> Government pension payments in the future will be linked to union agreed negotiated salary increases for civil servants, but not beyond the covered period of these negotiated settlements. At a request from government, the National Insurance Corporation, in consultation with the actuaries, have also decided to increase its minimum pension to $500 per month from the existing 300. About 2,400 pensioners will benefit from this increase effective 1st August 2024. This means, Mr. Speaker, that from 1st August 2024, no government or NIC pensioner in this country will receive less than $500 per month. <laughs> Waiver of stamp duty on house mortgages. Mr. Speaker, as part of the government's policy to encourage the renovation of new residential homes and renovations to existing homes, stamp duty on mortgages up to $400,000 taken for any of these two purposes will be waived. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, you may recall, in my budget address of 2022, I announced a tax amnesty with which was further expanded and extended in 2023 to May 1st, 2024. Unfortunately, the program has not been fully operationalized and therefore more time will be required to allow taxpayers to benefit 
from the tax amnesty program. Taxpayers are encouraged to make arrangements this fiscal year to take advantage of the benefits of the waiver of interest and penalties on outstanding taxes up to May the 1st, 2025. <coughs> waiver of residential land and house tax has also been extended to May 1st, 2025. <coughs> Sandbox regime innovation hub legislation. Mr. Speaker, we are living in a digital revolution. Innovation and technology, including blockchain and artificial intelligence, are clearly showing that the future belongs to the countries that can harness the opportunities of the digital revolution. Mr. Speaker, we intend to work with interested parties in this fiscal year with a view to introducing sandbox regime and innovation hub legislation to create the enabling environment for new technology-driven businesses. Introduction of a sovereign wealth fund. Mr. Speaker, for the last two years, we have been speaking about the creation of a sovereign wealth fund to create a multi-generational plan that would safeguard future generations. We are pursuing this initiative and have employed experienced advisors to assist. A memo is to be considered by cabinet to approve the way forward. I will update members on the progress of this initiative. Mr. Speaker, the budget will be financed as follows. Current revenue, 1,465,281,000. Capital revenue, two million eight hundred seventy-three thousand five hundred dollars. Grants, hundred eight million sixty-two thousand three hundred fifty-one dollars. Total revenue and grants, one billion five hundred seventy-six million two hundred seventeen thousand nine hundred fifty-one dollars. Total expenditure, one billion eight hundred ninety-four million. $110,800. Less tax refunds, $10 million and $14. Less amortization, $92,900,800. Overall deficit, $214,978,249. Net financing, net financing requirements, external borrowing, 243 million 813,204 dollars treasury bills and bonds 64 million 65,945 dollars total 207 million total finance required 207 million 879,149 dollars mr speaker if i conclude i'd like to thank you mr speaker and the staff of the parliament, the security personnel, and all others, others who helped in making this parliament session such a successful one. Personally, I would like to thank the members of my cabinet, the members of the St. Lucia Labour Party, the members of the Castries East constituency, the very special people of the Castries East constituency <coughs> and the people of St. Lucia generally. I want to thank my family, the staff of the Ministry of the Office of the Prime Minister, my personal assistant, my secretary, my press secretary, my security detail, and all others who have helped in making this job a little less stressful. Mr. Speaker, as I conclude, we are about to enter the beginning of our fourth year in government. And we fully expect to hear the absurdities from frustrated political aspirants who refuse to accept the very loud verdict of the St. Lucian people on the lack of stewardship and bad government between 2016 and 2021. Mr. Speaker, we walk in the knowledge that the better we do, 
the louder they will criticize. We walk in the knowledge that these failed politicians are driven not by a desire to serve the St. Lucian people, but by a burning hunger to serve themselves, their families, and their friends. Mr. Speaker, the latest actions by the opposition and the surrogates as it relates to our CIB program is a strong case in point. Mr. Speaker, there has not been one issue with our CIP program. No one has raised any negatives regarding the due diligence of our program. Our program is now well poised to deliver infrastructure in the form of roads, community centers, and hotels to our people without increasing the national debt. What is the opposition's response? Its leader and its surrogates are all over the world spreading falsehoods and misinformation, encouraging adversaries of our, of our island to denigrate our country. They do not care how these actions affect the prospects of employment for our youth, the implementation of universal health care, the level of investment, or even the impact of gun violence. This does not disturb their sleep or trouble their consciences. What matters is their own selfish desires to be in control, to victimize, and to be in power. Mr. Speaker, thanks to my team in government, we have remained focused on the development of our country. This is why we only have our St. Lucia, a place we call home, and will continue to protect it by putting our people first. We are products of St. Lucia. We have experienced three years of sustained economic growth. We have reduced employment by 8% and youth employment by 12%. We have reversed the lack of investment in our country and ensured that the benefits of tourism are being felt by the many and not the few. Mr. Speaker, in 2021, we aimed at transforming our economy to empower our people. We returned hope, good governance, integrity, and economic growth to our country. Our people are more confident and hopeful with a renewed faith in government as an instrument for good. In 2022, we tackled the neglect in healthcare and alleviated the social condition of the poor and underprivileged while improving citizen security. Mr. Speaker, in this year of infrastructure, I am satisfied that we have undertaken sufficient policy initiatives and interventions to realize the objectives of greater efficiency, effectiveness, and responsiveness in our physical, social, and digital infrastructure. Alongside the, reali the realization of these infrastructural objectives, we can look forward to growth in major sectors of the economy, new job opportunities, with youth employment on the rise, increased social protection for the vulnerable, and growing confidence in the good governance of our country among potential investors and the international community. By the end of this fiscal year, St. Lucia is expected to be a much better place. Mr. Speaker, we are not turning back. We want a better future for the next generation. It's our, duty to, it's our duty to ensure that our children have better opportunities to generate wealth and improve their standard of living. We need, a un, we need to be united as a country to achieve these goals. I call on all citizens of goodwill to join in the fight against violence, unemployment, envy, and hatred. My government is ready and willing to work with all people of goodwill to achieve these objectives. Mr. Speaker, let your eyes look straight ahead. 
fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the path of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right nor to the left, but keep your foot from evil. Mr. Speaker, I commend this budget for your approval. I thank you.